Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Lit RPG Podcast. I am Ramon Mejia. I'm here to bring you the latest Lit RPG news, reviews, and of course author interviews. Uh, now each week I bring you the latest uh, stuff. Uh, this week I'm actually going to be doing an author interview uh, with an author that you probably know, and if you don't, you should. Uh, you should have already read his stuff. You should be reading his newest stuff. Uh, he is the uh, author of the best-selling series, Way of the Shaman. He's also written the Galacticon series, the Doc Paulden series, uh, and most recently, he has a new series called Invasion, um, set in the same Way the Shaman of Barleone universe. He's also um, co-authored several author several books. He's uh, an editor as well, and he's also publishing in Russia some of the American literature. We're going to talk about all that stuff here, uh, but welcome to the show, Vasily Mahanenko. Hello, everyone. Vasily Mahanenko is here, and I'm happy to see you and hear, and uh, I'm happy to speak with you. Yes. Uh, now, this is actually going to be a slightly more casual conversation than we've had in the past, just because um, we're kind of already chummy. We've, we've talked plenty of times. We've even played some um, little RPG games on the air before. Uh, and you actually you are the one who suggested we just do a like, nice casual chat uh, um, about well what's happening with you, all the great projects that you have. Um, but I'm also assuming the new book that came out just this past weekend. Uh, this last few days ago, I should say, um, Invasion. So um, first, could you just, for anybody who hasn't heard of you, can you tell them a little bit about yourself and your work? Okay. Well, uh, my name is Vasily Mohanenko. I'm a Russian writer. I'm one of those who create such uh, terms like lead RPG. Uh, it was uh, 90, uh, 2012 years. Uh, when I started my first book, uh, The Way of the Shaman. And after this, uh, I was create more than 10 books. And uh, sometimes uh, I hope uh, I am an author. Sometimes I, I, I think that I am an author. Sometimes I think that I am not the author because I can't write my books. And uh, sometimes I think that I am some kind of mother because I have uh, three years children, a uh, child. Uh, he's a, a boy and uh, he's very um, quick boy. I think he's some kind of Superman. <laughs> and I'm tired. Sometimes I'm tired because of his uh, power, his speed, his everything. He's everywhere. <laughs> So, um, what about me? Uh, first of all, I am, was uh, a project manager. Uh, I worked uh, in sub-implementation for 30 years. And uh, I was a programmer, I was a project manager, I was a product manager, I was a chief of project office uh, of implementation of in information, in information systems. So I was a very clever and high skilled person. <laughs> But uh, someone, I've read a very interesting book. In Russia, it's called Valdira. In uh, English, it's called uh, Valdira. Yeah, it's the <laughs> I same hope name. It's Val yeah. Valdira was written by Dan Mikhailov. And uh, I decided that uh, I have to write uh, the similar book because there were no uh, book uh, like this. The only the moonlight sculptor, but uh, sculpture, but it uh, was on Korean and only six books translated into Russian. So I started to write by myself, and uh, after first book, after second book, after third book, our readers said, "Vasily, you are perfect. You are great. Uh, please uh, forget." about your first job and uh, became an author. I said, really? It's interesting. So after 
four years of creation books, I started a real writer. And now I'm a full-time writer. Uh, two years, I'm a full-time writer and uh, worked only for myself. And I hope it's uh, very interesting when you sit at home, when you don't see people, <laughs> when you don't see uh, mm, a crowd of people, and uh, I hate people. <laughs> 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 really, because uh, I worked with uh, people for 30 years, and uh, I managed them, and uh, I see the people fullness foolish and I see how people uh, can make uh, foolish things and that I tired from it and uh, when I sit at home I uh, just uh, write and I only see my family and nothing more and uh, I uh, see you <laughs> sometimes well thank you I'm glad that I, um, I you like seeing me sometimes but I can absolutely uh <laughs> I understand what you're saying and how you're feeling. Um, I think any anybody who's gone full time as an author um, can definitely appreciate those sentiments of like, oh yeah, I'm really a lot happier just working at home on things that I enjoy doing instead of uh, dealing with knuckleheads and, and and dumb people at work all the time. So I'm, you know, many people would yeah. empathize. Yeah. Yeah, sitting at home, it's very interesting. But I have a, for one problem. What's that? Uh, be, uh, because, um, uh, I th first of all, I thought that sitting at home, it's very interesting. That uh, you have a many time to create your worlds, to create your books, to imagine everything. But suddenly I understood that uh, it's wrong. Uh, because uh, when your children came to you and they say, Father, we want to go to another city, another country. We want to get mm, your time. We want you to go with us uh, into kindergarten or kinder place or other places. So when you returned home, you understand that uh, the full day was finished. The day was finished and you have only two or three hours to create your books. Not eight hours like uh, it was uh, <laughs> when I worked, but only two or three. It's uh, sometimes very uh, difficult for me to write books because, um, as I have said, my younger boy is a very quick book one, and he said on my head sometimes, I can uh, show you one uh, picture uh, after this review. When uh, I write a book and uh, my child sit on my head. <laughs> it, it, it's really... It's, um... No, no, yeah, I absolutely agree. Um, my wife and I just had a, had a kid. He's about three months old now. And he is a time sink. Uh, he's just... Um, and, it, and, it, and I don't mind it as a full-time author myself. It is just a matter of managing your time and making time to do your job, which is the writing part. Oh. Um, all the other stuff is really important, but you have to find a balance that works for you. And, and, and that balance is different for everybody. By the way, how do you feel like a father? I, it's a, it's a complex situation. It's a complex feeling for me because I, I, was, I was never really sure if I was going to be a good dad. And I'm still not really particularly sure about it. Um, but I know that I want to try my best to be so. Um, um, but I definitely, I, I love the kid. Um, his, uh, his name is Gabriel and I care about him, but it's, a uh, it's an interesting situation. Uh, cause right now my wife is home. She's on maternity leave. So we're doing this together, but when she goes back to work later this month, then it's going to be just me and the baby, uh, <laughs> Yeah, and it's going to be like, oh, that's a that'll be a much more interesting situation to write with, like the baby strapped to me, uh, or, or something. So it's, a, but it's it's been enjoyable. Um, the baby's pretty good, so I'm happy with that. Uh, my older daughter, she's uh, 40 years old, and uh, when I was working like a project manager, I haven't seen her. Uh, when I was fired, oh, not fired. 
when I decided to become an author, an only author, I sat at home and f- understood that suddenly I have a 12 years daughter. I haven't seen her before, <laughs> but suddenly, boo, and I get a daughter with 12 years old and uh, with her teenagers' problems, with uh, teenagers' uh, <sighs> Dangerous uh, attitude. Tem- temper. Temper. This <laughs> <laughs> teenager's temper, yeah. And uh, now I try to spend uh, a lot of time with my child, uh, with my uh, with my daughter, with my son, because uh, it's very interesting to work with them, to speak with them, to create uh, them from a children to a um, human because uh, it's some kind of you know, wait for a second I have to uh, neural network well, well, while I was a programmer I was great pro- programmer I create some kind of neural network and uh, I saw how it's uh, grow, how it's uh, learned, how it's uh, became stronger, how it uh, tries to understand everything, how it's tried to fix, uh, try to understand which color is near here. And uh, to grow children, not to grow, to... Wait for the- a second. Mm-hmm. To educate children is some kind uh, of this, because uh, first of all they can't s- get a spoon. For uh, for example, you teach them how to take a spoon, to take a knife. They first uh, ache. They first uh, everything. And it's very interesting to find how they feel themselves when they first laugh in someone, when they first uh, see uh, danger, when they first see uh, happiness, when they first see uh, something interesting. And it's really interesting to communicate with children and find how they uh, became a, a human. Yes, I actually enjoy the way you're phrasing it um, when they go from being a, a this entity to being an actual human who can think and feel and form their own opinions. Uh, it's a very interesting um, transition between those particular big moments in their lives. And, and as parents, I think it matters most to us, obviously. Um, the rest of the world is like, they don't always care, but um, it is, as, as someone who's just being a dad, I'm like, oh yeah, I'm getting those moments of like, oh, on a daily basis, this kid is changing. He's developing uh, in little tiny ways nobody else is probably going to care about or notice, but they're like little small things. He's learning how to do this or, you know, whatever. And it's a very interesting shift um, as he grows it and, and working full time. Sometimes it's like, as like on a job outside of your home, it's like, you miss all those things. You miss all those moments of growth and development. And then suddenly one day you turn around and they're a, they're a person. They're a human mm-hmm. and, and you missed all the other stuff between and, you know, it, you can't get it back. So I'm like, oh, yeah. So in some ways, I feel very happy that um, I'm able to do this with uh, my kid and, and help to raise him on a daily basis. So it's, it's fortunate for me. But um, before we lose our entire audience talking about parent stuff, <laughs> uh, let's talk about a little bit more about your uh, your new series. Um, it's called. Um, the Second Chance uh, Invasion Book One. Um, can you tell me something about that? Oh, um, invasion! It was created. Um, uh, I was um, decided to create this book after the sixth book of the Shaman. Uh, I knew who were uh, one and a half years ago. I understand understood who will be my main character. It's a project manager, a clever man. Not a shaman, uh, not feelings, only brains, <laughs> only thoughts, and only uh, smart things. Uh, so I decided to create uh, such a person. But uh, I understood that 
I have to give him someone who more clever than he is. And it was Eridani. Eridani, it uh, sounds in, in English, yes? Yes, uh, that, that, that's the name of him, uh, Eridani. Yes, Eridani. Um, uh, after seven books of the shaman, <laughs> uh, it was some interesting uh, situation when uh, someone was died. Have died. Someone. Mm-hmm. And uh, suddenly... The invasion was started uh, after six months after finished uh, the plot of the seventh shaman. It was uh, the six months between this s- series in timeline. So uh, when I started seventh uh, six uh, where the shaman, I understood that uh, Edidani. Uh, that it will be uh, some kind of uh, Eridan. <laughs> and uh, it will be the father of Anasteria. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> you, know, you don't understand? No, no, I, I was going to ask you about that question later. Like, oh, who is who is Eridani? Because they, in, in the first book, you intentionally ha- have rules set out where you can't tell who he is, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm sorry for spoiler. <laughs> no, no, I was going to ask you. I was like, I was going to see if I could get you to tell me. And you did. You did it on your own. So that I'm totally happy. This entire interview has been super great for me. Yep. Eridani have not died. Mm-hmm. Oh, not, not Eridani. The father of Anasteria not died. Uh, in the third, uh, first, second, third, in the third book, I will answer all questions about him. And now, in the second, my main character, Qualen, understood who he is. And also, in this book, in the second book, will appear Anasteria, Mahan, Plinta. They all appear, but uh, the main plot is uh, going from the point of view of the cleverest man, the project manager, who started to create his own clan, 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 his own party, Mm -hmm. (laughs) his own guild in the in Barleona because um, he und- he understood something. In first book, uh, the situation, the social situation in my world uh, is not very easy for uh, someone because I uh, thought, what happened when people get some kind of uh, IE? Uh, Intel ER. Wait for a second. Sure. Artificial intelligence, IE. Ah, what happened when people will get some kind of IE? And uh, what happened with people, what happened with their work, what happened with their world, what happened with uh, us uh, when uh, 90% of our job will do by machines, machines. And what? Our government will kill everyone because people can do nothing. They no, no, not can do. They haven't worked, they haven't uh, abilities to mm. right, right, so I think the, the, to win talking, about, yeah, talking about the premise of the first book, or the first book in the series is essentially more and more people are being replaced, not like physically, but like their jobs yep. are being replaced by, um, you call them imitators in the book um, but artificial imitators. intelligence would be the same kind of concept um and so, like everybody, not just like not manual, not just manual laborers, but teachers and specialists and, and engineers, because yep. these artificial intelligences are smart enough to actually do like real work. So everybody's being laid off because it's just cheaper to buy an imitator and have them work for essentially free. And this is this is the, one of the things I really love about your series is the fact that these aren't imaginary things. Like these are these are slightly conceptualized into the future where they're you're, you're seeing like possibly where things are going to go but 
you know, artificial intelligence is, is a real thing in our world. And, and w more and more people over the course of our history have been replaced by machines, by automation. Um, and, and so it's not this far fetched concept, which is one of the things I love in that you're, 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 you're kind of looking into the yes. future a little bit. Uh, and, and so uh, your main character, um, Brody West, uh, is one of those people who got laid off. And so he's gets a new job. But uh, artificial intelligence, which we have right now, mm -hmm. is not enough artificial right. intelligence. It's just uh, it's just clever program. Yes. It, uh, but uh, they have uh, they can't change us. They can't for right now change uh, all of our work, all of our uh, abilities. But in the nearest future, when it this uh, some kind of capsules will be appeared uh, when uh, the NPC in the game will answer like a, a real person, like a real life person. When you understood that you didn't uh, see the change between real people and program NPC, after this. Uh, this uh, artificial intelligence will be enough to replace our uh, to, to replace human from every uh, work, <laughs> for example. Right. And I really uh, afraid or afraid. I don't want this time. Yeah, game. it's definitely not. Um, the real world isn't a hopeful place in your story universe. The real world is, is very sad. Um, and, and the fact that people can only really earn a living um, by playing a video game, by playing in the Bar Leona game for, for credits and having things transferred over. Yeah. Um, and I actually, I, one of the really cool things I, I liked about the real world storyline in, in Invasion was that you logically set up the consequences of what this artificial um, replacement concept would do, including putting people on government programs where housing and food and shelter are all provided by the government as long as they stay like, what is it, 20 hours in game every day. And they just, they get out for four hours every day. That way it minimizes resource use. Um, but that, that is a very logical consequence of, of that kind of um, real life situation where artificial intelligences are, have the capacity to just replace uh, the jobs of, of everybody almost on the planet to some degree or another. Um, and I thought that was a very, I love that just to me, the logical process that makes perfect sense. That I, it makes the story world feel um, real and balanced and grounded. And that makes the story better for me, I think. Hmm, thank you. <laughs> uh, in the second book, I continue this idea. And now my main character will uh, try to find his, his uh, place uh, his, uh, in this world and he's understood that uh, his uh, work is not to work for himself uh, his, uh, he has an idea to get uh, people from these social places and to get one by one from it and uh, well, I hope um, I will write my second book in um, in the end of the August, and maybe in the February of next year it will be translated. Right, and I actually like your main character a lot, Birdie West. He's a uh, when I read in the book, he was a prodigy man. I was like, oh, that's that's what's silly. He's he's pulling from his real life. No, no, he's, he's no. Pull, well, you're pull, you're pulling information from your real life, like your experiences as a product manager. I, I would assume like yes. you're basing. Uh, uh, like I was a project. Yeah, I, I, I was a project manager, mm -hmm. but I have to say that um, I have uh, I I wrote a, a shaman of from myself really. Right. Shaman, it's me, a man, uh, because uh, I am very uh, expensive. Oh, not expensive. <laughs> Wait, <for a> second, <laughs> not 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 too expensive. <laughs> Uh, emotional, emotional, and very emotional, okay. though. and uh, I not to use my brain. I use my feelings. But Brody, it's my friend. It's a really, uh, it's a real man. 
uh, from whom I wrote uh, this character, uh, we worked together for 10 years. He's also project manager and he's uh, also and he's very clever. He's don't believe anyone but only brains, uh, only thoughts, only uh, he, uh, he use only minds, not feelings. And when I uh, give him a finished book to read, he uh, told me that I was uh, very, uh, I'm trying to use the correct words, I am not good boy because I wrote him in a real manner. Uh, in a real world and uh, he saw in himself like in a mirror. And uh, he don't like uh, Brody because uh, he don't like Wallen because uh, he saw himself. Oh, that's unfortunate. But I like that character. I think Brody West is interesting. And you're right. He, he's very different from Mahan. And that's you uh, emotionally, the emotional person. Um, but Brody is very intelligent and he's, he's very logical. He's okay with, you know, cutting ties with people or, or cutting people from jobs if they're not doing their jobs based upon like real metrics and intelligence things. Um, and he's a project manager. Did you, did you pull information from your experience as a project manager for the story? Cause I, it, the, yeah. that part of it felt really real. I was like, Oh yeah. All these, all the, the manipulation or the, um, things that I saw in the story. I was like, this is, this is beautiful. This is, this is so realistic. Uh, cause I've been in, I've been in meetings like that before in my life. I'm like, yeah, that's uh that's you go through training and you go through that kind of stuff. Um, and it felt that like there's some very interesting themes in this book uh, about, um, the importance of socializing and how technology can strip our ability to, to even talk to each other and have social skills anymore. Um, and I thought that was a very, also a very interesting consequence of, of, of the, this kind of world that you developed in that technology is everywhere and everybody plays video games and nobody talks to each other anymore. And so there's, as, as the main character, Birdie West gets this new job and he's very fortunate to get one. Um, the job is forcing him to, to change uh, and to be social and not to be such a workhorse where he's working and that's all he does to, to force him to like expand his, his kind of social circle. By the way, uh, I have some, I, I, I tell you some secret. Sure. Do you know who the main character of the first book and the second book of the series of invasion? Can it's you say that again for me? Who's the main character of uh, the invasion series? You mean like who is he? Isn't he Brody West the main character? No. <laughs> no. Uh, no. Uh, the main character of this uh, series is Eridani. Oh, okay. So the, it's the second person. I, no, he's not second. No, no. I mean, he's the second. Um, he's the second tiefling, right? Yeah, the second tiefling. Yeah, the second tiefling. The main. Well, but the story is told from the perspective of Brody West, right? Because the name of uh, first book, the second chance. Yeah, it's not second chance for Brody or Qualen. It's second chance for father of uh, Anasteria to became in real life. Right. And then for the audience members who don't remember who Anasteria's father, he was the head of um, the Phoenix clan, right? In the Way yeah. of the Shaman. Right. So that's probably how they're going to remember him most if you've read the Way of the Shaman series. And so there are circumstances in there that put him out of the picture. And so six months later, he's showing up here as, um, as, as a tiefling and he has very unique circumstances in which he can't reveal his real name. He can't reveal his affiliations. He can't contact the other people who he had uh, previous connections with. Uh, and so he's starting over and this is his second chance, according to what you're telling me. Is that, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Notwithstanding the plot of going from the Qualen's point of view, the main character is Eridani. And uh, after the seventh book of The Way of the Shaman, there were many questions for me. Uh, what about Alta Metaphor? Why uh, everyone need this castle? And now in this series, I will answer this question. Why Alta Metaphor need 
for people from behind and others and why uh, Eridani goes to in a prison was a prisoner and uh, what happened with everyone yeah cuz yeah cuz the second well, tiefling Eridani it would be interesting yeah yeah yeah, he and, shows up uh, as a prisoner in in the, in in this book, and he's he's I guess he's a mysterious character in book one, um, and you've revealed quite a bit about him. Just just telling me like, wow, that's because I I I was in my mind when I read it first, like, is this Mahan? Is it is, is he, did he go back to jail for some reason, and now he's <laughs> popping up here as as this tiefling character? And I thought maybe he knows about the crafting skill, and I'm like, I was trying to figure out in my brain who he was actually going to be because very few people in the way the shaman series knew about that particular skill, even though they take it out of the game in, in the invasion update. Um, but it's like, you left little clues about who this may be. And there you go. Now we all know. So that's, thank you very much for letting me know, man. And us know about that. Well, I hope, I, I think let's forget about invasion. Yeah. Galactagon. Yes. Galactagon I, is, 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 is the next one. Now you actually, yeah. So that you, Book two, no, what book are we on in Galacticon? We, you have book two come out recently. You have book three coming out in the near future? Yeah, but yeah. In, the, in the end of the August. Yeah. But, you know, of August, I hope. And that's, is that the last I, book I in the series? I don't remember the co correct uh, date, but uh, sometimes uh, maybe in the end of the August or in the start of the September. I'd... Right. We can look it up. We'll, I'll put it in the show notes. <laughs> I'll it correct it. Um, but that's, is that the last book in that series? Yep. It the last so it'll tie everything uh, up together. So the Galacticon series, um, I'll show the picture for everybody so you can see. Yeah, this one here um, is is the Galacticon series. Uh, so they'll yeah. be able to see the, the picture of it. This book was written in uh, six years ago. Yeah, and the second <laughs> uh, was written only after five years after this, and you were happy because I uh, not. American people was lucky because the, they uh, waiting only four years because of translation. <laughs> yeah, we, we just got Galacticon 2 last year. Or not, yeah, about last year. Uh, so I'm like, yeah, that sounds, hasn't been that long since four that years. came out. Uh, and it, was, it, felt like it, it, it felt like there was a big time gap there as far as the storytelling goes. Like You could tell it's been years and years and years between book one and book and book two, uh, just from like the tone and the game mechanics and that, like that kind of tonal stuff. Um, but it's still a very entertaining story. And I'm, I'm happy to see that you're finishing off the series uh, and that fans of that series will be happy to know there's going to be an actual conclusion uh, to that storyline instead of just like this major cliffhanger that book one left us in for years and years. I'm sorry I was unhappy after book one. I don't know why, but it's really I was unhappy. Uh... I don't like the first Galactagon. Mm, I don't. Uh, I can say that's my poor book. Sorry for those who don't like uh, Dark Paladin, but I, I think that Dark Paladin series is more interesting than the first Galactagon. <laughs> I think that you know all the rules and all the all the game mechanics are really important to you, and you have all the details there. So I think sometimes, as as because it, it's a difference between being the writer and loving your world because you know all the details and we spent so many so much time with the characters and the rules and then a reader kind of just seeing what we're showing them you know what i mean we, we're only showing them a certain level of that information but we have in our brains tons of information and tons of background and tons of like emotional attachment to the characters so sometimes there's just this disconnect and i think one of the things that stopped people from enjoying i think the dark paladin as much as other books was that the game mechanics were different. Like the rules, like the game rules were different than they were used to. And so there's like this adjustment, right? If you can go through that adjustment period of understanding the rules, great, you're happy. But if you can't, it's it's harder to like feel connected to sometimes, mm. I think. I can't say show you my working files because uh, I can't uh, understand how it's to show my uh, screen. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I prepare a very uh, large file for every world. It's huge documents. Yes. Uh, sometimes uh, it's more bigger than the book. For example, uh, my working file for Sevens of Shaman 
uh, which in include all of uh, game mechanics from previous uh, six books, was bigger bigger than uh, the seventh book itself. Yes, yeah. uh, seventh book have uh, one thousand hundred uh, one hundred thousand words in in Russian. And game mechanics for this book uh, have uh, one and a half thousand, uh, hundred thousand uh, words. And uh, it's really a big uh, document and uh, to change, not to change, to, 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 <laughs> to switch between uh, worlds very difficult. Sometimes, because you have to remember all of uh, things, all of small things. Oh yeah, everything like the way that you do your notifications, uh, all the way you format your your character sheets, or like the skills you have there listed and how they're worded. If you don't mm -hmm. keep track of that stuff, you're never going to remember it on your own. Uh, I, I do the same thing. Like I have Excel sheets of everything. Um, like just reams and reams of like, like notes about w little phrases or, or background information or how did I describe this power? Uh, was it like blue or was it yellow that the light was? I can't, you know, all, all those little yeah. tiny details. Yeah, um, right, you are. Uh, but after my wife said that I have to finish the series, I said I uh, reread the first book and I created a plot for two books. And I finished them, and uh, the second and the third book, I happy of him, and I I like them. Really, I sometimes I hope that it, it the first book will escape, will disappear. Uh, somebody steal it. <laughs> oh, I <laughs> like the first book. I think that I was probably. It's a very interesting book, and I think it made people think it was one of the only few sci-fi um, literary stories at the time when it was first uh, translated into English. So I think a lot of people appreciated the change of uh, of setting from fantasy to science fiction. I think they like that too. Yeah, I was started this book because I also wanted to change uh, setting. Yeah. Because uh, everyone in Russia started to write in uh, fantasy, and I, ho I I thought, okay, I will write in sci fi. I will, I will, uh, not I will write, I, I wrote in sci fi. But um, the book is easy. The book, uh, the plot is easy the plot uh, the main character is <sighs> no no i, I heard yeah, easy I, uh, yeah. every everything in this book is easy and i'm not uh, happy from myself from this book oh well i think it's okay well, at, so... at least you know that people enjoyed it and i think that's that's an important aspect i other people really appreciate it to some degree or another. Even if you personally have, you know, issues with your story, I think every author kind of has issues with every story they read it to some degree or another. Um, but people enjoyed it and they bought it and they'll hopefully continue enjoying the rest of the series to its conclusion. But I, I, I definitely resonate myself while changing genre or changing backgrounds as well. Cause I, I also wrote Lit RPG, the adventures and terror series, and I had to shift my, my own stories just, just to try something new. And I wrote something that was a real life lit RPG uh, called Project Alpha. And then I wrote a sci-fi story-ish lit RPG story called um, Planet Bound. And that one didn't do as well. I was like, oh, that's that's too bad because I had fun writing it. But it's it's a lot more science fiction-y in that it's set in the future. It's set in space and he's trapped on a planet. Um, and not all those transitions, all those new stories always, they're not always as well received as we hope they are. Um, so I can definitely empathize with you on, on that respect as well. <laughs> yeah. I wish the, I wish all my stuff sold. I wish all my stuff was just super popular, but it's, it's not always the case or, or, or different fans like different things and you'll just get different fans for all your different stuff. And that's, that's all. Okay. Well, I really hope that people like it, uh, and they, uh, admire from my, this Syria. <sighs> But not me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, that's perfectly. That's fine. I mean, that that's good. Um. So you've we have invasion, and then we have uh, Galacticon coming up after that. 
Um, now you've worked on other things. Is there anything else you're working on at the moment that you want to talk about? Well, what else? Um, it's not lit RPG, but uh, this uh, month also will appear some epic fantasy from me and uh, also not from me. I worked like a editor in this fantasy and right. uh, you, you can find it uh, here. It's called, uh, it's called, yep, Dancing on the Block. Yes, Dancing on the Block by uh, Marina... Barina Barinova. Uh, why? <laughs> Sorry. Prosley. Last year. Last year. Last year I was uh, started uh, some kind of. Sorry, competition. Some kind of competition between Russian authors. Uh, and uh, told them that uh, if you book, okay, if it's interesting, I will give money to translate it into English and uh, to put it in, to replace your book on Amazon. Right. Uh, there was 200 uh, books on this competition and Marina was one. Uh, this uh, competition, he was a winner, but uh, her books wasn't enough uh, for Amazon without editing. So I sat down and uh, spent a lot of time to edit this book, uh, to change it, uh, to change some plots. And uh, Marina agreed with some my uh, um, words. Marina disagreed with some. Uh, wait for a second. With some offer, oh, offer, <laughs> with some proposal or oh, proposal mm. offer suge suggestion. Sorry, Su this word is suggestion. I suggest her to change something. I suggest you not to change something. And uh, after half a year, we created the first book, Dancing on the Block. It's uh, not lit RPG. It's only epic fantasy. It's a uh, real fantasy. And uh, in Russia, it's very popular fantasy. And I hope our readers also will find it interesting. And uh, they like our authors. Uh, because um, Marino, Marina is some kind of uh, Russian George Martin. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> someone called her like this. Russian George Martin or George Martin in... Uh, George Martin in skirt. <laughs> well, that's good. I hope the book does well as well. But it's I, I do know that I have uh, other publishers um, in Little RPG who have also tried to expand into fantasy or into um, just straight science fiction without Little RPG. And they've had um, decent enough, um, I think, success, but not as nearly as much as their Little RPG stuff because we're a very focused group. Of, like We like our game mechanics, I think, in Little RPG. So yeah. Sometimes that translation between those two groups isn't always as... as it, plus, also fantasy is it's just a bigger genre. It's just it's a much bigger competition with with like the world and i think that we benefit as liberty authors in that we have a much smaller group we have a, a lot less competition uh between even good authors and i, I th it's, all, it's always so amazing to me that the best liberty authors are just regular people who decided to write they're not professional writers they're not people who necessarily have you know 30 books to their name before they started writing liberty they're gamers they're engineers they're project managers they're doctors or they're just regular people who love RPG mechanics and decided to write and yep. they found some good success. And I think that's always one of the things about our genre that people don't appreciate I, is that we're regular people. We're just fans. And we decided to write. I know that uh, your podcast is only for a little RPG and I just informed about this book. Yeah, no, no, no. It's uh, not that. It's just like, oh, it's just that Marina, I think that that book can potentially have some good sales, but it's, it's going to be a struggle, I, I think. 
Yeah. I hope I will uh, get some Russian authors who wrote uh, liter- who write lit RPG and translate them. Yeah. Uh, but uh, for now, I uh, right because you've also been, you've been uh, in publishing too, right? No, I'm not a publisher. Well, you 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 worked on Kazimo Yap's book to publish it in Russian, right? I, I'm just uh, gave uh, I just translated book. Okay. Uh, some kind of wait for a second. I'm just Mitsunas. 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 Well, <laughs> it doesn't. Well, I just translate book. Uh, I put it in on Amazon, uh, and uh, after I've got uh, money for translation, uh, I, I gave a uh, book for author, and uh, after this, he get his money because uh, I'm not agent. Right. I'm just I'm author, and my uh, my goal is. Um, To get author in Russia and to put him in uh, Amazon, right. not earn money from him, right? Just interest. Okay, no, no, that that makes perfect sense. That's I think it's I think it's okay that you make a little money for your effort in addition to like covering the cost of uh, of translation because oh. we've I mean there have been several authors in the literary community who've also kind of expanded from just being an author to being an, uh, we call them indie publishers, like smaller publishing companies where they publish other literary authors and they do the editing and they do the cover, they pay for cover art, they pay for translation work or, the, or, or um, they also pay for advertising, right? So they're, they're putting an effort to help promote the author and, and help them do well. And so I think it's okay that they, you know, kind of make some, a, a tiny bit of extra money from their work. I think that's only yes. expected in the United States. So we're, 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 I think we're all okay with that. As long as we're, as long as it's benefiting everybody, we're like the author be- benefits because he's getting a lot more publication. He's okay. getting more um, publicity. He's doing better than he would on his own. I think everybody's happy with that. Usually. You see, Russia is not uh, so uh, expensive country and people here have not enough money to translate book. Yeah. In the USA, it's uh, easy. You wrote your book. You find uh, some kind of some, you find uh, a cover, and you put your book on Amazon. That's it. Yeah. But in Russia, you have to write your book. You have to find translator. You have to find editor after translator, and only this you put your book on Amazon, and it's very expensive. Yes, um, I think you, you once told me it was like thirty thousand dollars or something along those lines to mm-hmm. do the entire process from start to finish with multiple editors. Uh, multiple it translators. 11, yeah, it's it's really yeah. expensive. It costs eleven cents for one word. Wow. Uh, eleven cents. Yeah. Each book have uh, one hundred thousand uh, yeah. words, so it's easy calculation. Yeah, that's yeah. That can be and, super expensive. Uh, um, and how how did Cosmo Yap uh, for people who know uh, Cosmo Yap wrote the um, the game series? Um, in, in the United States, and, and Vasily Manko worked with him to translate it and publish it in Russian. How did that project ah. go for you? Oh, I'm not agent. <laughs> no, no, you're not the agent, but you definitely... I thought it was well, an interesting project. I, 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 and I, I like the fact uh, that you were very open about the results of that project with um, other people, well, other writers. Uh, um, you see? Yeah. Uh, one time I decided to give our readers uh, ability to uh, to read uh, author from USA. Uh, only 10 or 12 percent of uh, Russian can uh, understood English. Right. And only 2 or 3 percent can read English books. Mm-hmm. So there are a lot of interesting lit RPG stories here. Uh, I use your site. I found uh, the f- uh, lead RPG recommendation, and I saw that the first line, yep, I use your site, and the first line was Casimo Yap, uh, Travis Bugwell, and uh, I don't remember yeah, the third one. Michael Scott Earl, and it will be the uh, yeah his Lion Quest series. Yep, uh, this guy get uh, nine from ten, nine point from you. Mm-hmm. So uh, I wrote all of them. Uh, Travis said that he's not 
he don't want to translate his book. I don't know why. Uh, Casimo said, okay, man, uh, what is your condition? Right. Um, I said that uh, after uh, a lot of type of condition I uh, gave Casimo, we uh, concluded, um, oh, wait for a second. <laughs> contract, contract. <laughs> we signed a contract and uh, I started to translate his book. Um, I don't uh, take uh, the rights from the text. The rights uh, stay in, in the author. I only take rights, not, um, I, I take rights for those translations which I create because I, without it, I can't uh, put this translation in Russian sites. Right. Um, so if someone thinks that he sold uh, rights for me for, from his book, his mistake. Okay. That's not, uh, and uh, all of rights uh, stay in with author. Um, Casimo was very um, the first two books. Casimo uh, was very uh, successful. In in Russia, our readers was very interested in it, and after this, I uh, signed contract uh, with Tao Wong and Shemir Kuznets. Nice. Tao Wong already uh, translated and his first book also in Russia uh, on this side. Shemir Kuznets, uh, Kuznets, Kuznets, Shemir. Doesn't matter. I don't know, know how it's spelled. Right now, for the uh, audience, uh, Tao Wong writes the um, System Apocalypse series. Uh, um, System Apocalypse. Uh, and uh, yep. uh, Shimmer Kunz is he writes the um, the Life Reset series, the one where the Life character's resets. a goblin. Um, yep. All those audiobooks in English, I think, were done by um, uh, Shimmer. It's yeah. Life Reset yeah. and uh, System Apocalypse is Tao Wong. Right. Yep. Um, also, Shimmer will. Uh, Shemer's book will appear in a few months, and uh, the third book of Casimo will also appear in a few months in Russia. Good, and the, and they all and, did well, uh, pretty well in in Russian. Yes, our readers very interested in it, but of course, um, in Russia we haven't uh, such uh, audience like uh, in Amazon. We have uh, no more than two thousand people who do twenty thousand people who can uh, spend their time and money for uh, electronic books but uh, we can find these two twenty thousand people and sold them the books and uh, to get money and uh, American also can also get money from this not spend n spend nothing because right. uh, translation, marketing, cover, and everything, uh, I took on my place. Right. So essentially, you, like I said, the 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 sips you're describing to me, it sounds like a publisher to me. I mean, I know you're saying that you're not. I, um, I, I right. I, right. I'm not a publisher, right, right. but I but worked like a right. publisher. You're kind of yeah. working like a publisher, and I think that's really good. I think it's one of those things that, um, it's it's a it's a as far from the writer standpoint, I think it's a, a, a revenue stream. It's a, a source of money that isn't costing the author anything potentially by getting it translated by the yourself. I know oh, Magic Stone Books sorry, has sorry, met, sorry. also offered to do this kind of work too, but it's the same thing that I've said about like audiobooks. Like you, it's it's another source of income that's using your same story, so it doesn't really cost you too much potentially to to get it done uh, if you're doing things like revenue sharing. Or if like somebody's going to take on all the all the financial burden doing it, and then you, you know you you split the uh, the royalty shares, um, and so I think that's a very interesting way thing that you're doing, and I'm happy to see that it's working out for you. And it's working out for the authors. I think that uh, this is a way that 
um, authors can, you know, continue to make a living um, doing these other projects and, and doing multiple streams of, of, of creative work from the same work, like making an audiobook, translating to other languages. I know that Magic Dome Books has also um, expanded beyond English into like German um, and, and they're doing pretty well there in, in those other marketplaces because well, they're seeing the same kind of concepts of like, yeah, we're just which continue to do what we're doing just in other languages and other, other streams. And it's working out, I think, well for them. Um, I think that uh, you're right. And uh, I think that also who write only on one, one language uh, is very, not, not poor, not unhappy, but it's not normal. Right. Because you're an author. You have to give your books for everyone. Not only for American readers, for Chinese, for Russian, German, uh, everyone. Because, uh, first of all, you get money and you get audience for other books. And audience means you get more money. <laughs> yes, that's, and that's kind of it. Not, not that the authors are trying to be greedy, but like we all have bills to pay. We, you know, we, we need income to, to continue to be full time writers. Uh, and so, and it's it's always good to have as many fans as possible. And we, I personally definitely hope that the entire world reads about the way of the shaman and all your other works, so that uh, everybody knows your name and knows your good writing. Um, but I think this is kind of about the end of the. I want wanted to contact with you about an hour. We're hitting about the hour mark here. Uh, so we'll try to wrap it up. Was there anything else you wanted to talk about um, that we haven't already touched on? Any products you wanted to promote besides uh, the things we've already talked about? One more, please. <laughs> sorry, sorry. We're going to wrap a things up. Slowly. No problem. We're going to wrap things up. Um, so I wanted to know if there's anything else that you wanted to talk about before we ended uh, the interview. Mm, yep. One thing. Uh, in November... I plan to visit USA, I plan to visit Vegas, and I plan to visit uh, oh, 50 books. It's uh, called 20 books to 50K, uh, I believe. Uh, or is it 50 books to 20K? I think it's the other way around. But it's one of those two. It's a it's basically a writer conference in um, Las Vegas. Um, I yep. think I think it's fifty books to twenty or twenty books to fifty k. Where the idea is that it uh, that if you have a back catalog of stuff, um, you can use that and promote it uh, to make a living essentially. And the, the it's just a title, it's a name, but it's a writer group, and they are they're very interested in Lunar PG as a potential place to write uh, their stories. Uh, and for people, it, it's a it's called a right to, I think more of a right to market group and also just like a writer's support group um, where they try to figure out ways to make writing to a business. And it's not as much about creativity sometimes as much as about practicality of this is how you make writing to a business and to be successful, you know, you should probably be doing certain things, but it's also like people just sharing their wisdom about writing create creatively, but also marketing and, and those other businessy aspects of it. But it's also a fun product. Yeah. I know that they have a panel there in November on Lit RPG specifically, um, with Michael Anderley, with uh, who's who's just starting Lit RPG, but he's done a few game novels with yourself, hopefully. Uh, Dakota Kraut, uh, James Hunter, um, James Baldwin is also going to be there. So a bunch of Lit RPG authors um, are going to be in that panel, and I'm, I'm I'll be attending, um, and so I'll I'll be able to talk to you guys. I hope hopefully, I meet you here. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully, we'll go out to dinner or something and have a nice time. And I look forward to being able to meet with you in person if you can <laughs> come over, if your visa stuff works out and you can make it. No. Yeah. Uh, I've got an uh, invitation yeah. on this uh, 20 Books Vegas self-published author conference. And I hope uh, that uh, it will be easy for me to get visa and I will be there yeah, on 12th so. of November. And uh, this time I will answer, I will talk about uh, how to, mm, our trans, your trans, mm, how Americans translate, uh, translate of, yeah, how American authors goes to Russian market on, in, in Russia, how their books, uh, our audience like or dislike, and uh, tell uh, everything about it. And perhaps I will answer also about my future project. I have three of them. Uh, and uh, I, 
I want to write some books about sport lit RPG. Oh, good. No, that, that should be fun. Yeah, oh, I, I, that works. I, I, I'm uh, some kind of fan of uh, Washington Capitals. I like Avechkin and Kyle. It's forever. And I want to write a hockey lit RPG. Hey, uh, if anybody can do it, I, I think you can make it interesting. So, <laughs> I, <laughs> so there it goes. Well, so um, I look forward to seeing. Yeah, I definitely look forward to seeing. I thank you very much for taking the time to to come on the show and to just chat with me. It's always fun just to talk to you uh, and and to to see you and to you're such a nice guy uh, and you're such a good writer. And I was I was, always enjoy your stories, um, but more than that, I, I always just enjoy picking your brain and talking to you and seeing what your story it is. Cause you're, sometimes your perspective is, is different than the American perspective. And that's good. I think that's one of the things that Russian authors have an advantage of is that their culture comes through in their stories and it feels, um, exotic or different for American audiences. And so it feels special. Um, and I've always appreciated that about, about your writings. Yeah. We are very different. Uh, when I started to communicate with uh, Americans, I found that uh, when you told about uh, something or when you invite uh, someone, you told, it's my, I spend for, not, uh, I pay, or I invite you to drink a couple of beer, I paid for this beer. In Russia, no one tell you that I pay for this. Because uh, it's uh, normal in our culture <laughs> to say people about money. Uh, we in Russia we uh, we don't like this theme. We started to shout to sh people when they told about who will pay for this. Everyone say no, no, no. Uh, we we will think about after all, and when you uh, Americans, uh, it's very different. Way first, I invite you, I, I I'll pay. I invite you, I don't pay. You pay for yourself. Right. It's really it's a frank it's discussion. Very... Yeah, absolutely. And that just that's one like cultural nuances like that. I think are super fascinating, um, and I think again, that's one of the things that. It, shifts and you don't realize that there are differences like that until you're exposed to someone else's culture until you see the world through their eyes and even like those little tiny differences about the way we treat each other the way we refer the way we joke um the jokes that we make or the little cultural things like you talk about just like deciding like who's paying for dinner if you go out whether it's going to be like i pay for myself you pay your for yourself or i'm going to pay for everybody um in america those things are very frankly decided like we're at, I, I was just today planning, uh, talking to uh, 20 people about um, who's uh, uh, a dinner we're going to go to in, in, in uh, for DragonCon. And it was like a 30 page, like a really long conversation about like, what's it going to cost? How are we going to split this up? Um, what are we ordering? And what's the deposit going to be? And it was just a very frank, open discussion. And nobody had problems with it. But for telling me that that conversation wouldn't exist in Russian uh, in a Russian like uh, Russian group because it it's it's a little taboo to talk about that kind of that kind of stuff. So fascinating things about like the differences between cultures, and I think again that's that's one of the things I think that gives you an advantage. I think uh, in the American marketplace and maybe also the other round like American writings in, in the Russian marketplace, like those those cultural differences help make the stories feel interesting uh to a reader who's maybe just used to reading the same kind of stories all the time um mm -hmm. but again i just want to thank you for for again taking the time to to talk to me today um i'll win in the broadcast and we can continue to talk afterwards of course um but for everybody who's watching thank you for taking the time to watch uh me and vasily mahenko um everybody thank you very much and until we can hang out again remember to go read some more literary folks goodbye everybody goodbye read our books read our books <laughs> all of them all the books <laughs>